We are taking a whirlwind tour through um, a great body of research. And the way that we assembled this research, we did a lot of secondary research. So we, we know there's a lot of information about millennials out there. And, and we went through all the studies um, from Pew and all of the secular studies on millennials. And then we also went through um, the evangelical research on millennials. And, and you may have seen some of the Barna research. So we, we looked at all of those. And then we identified 50 uh, in ministry leaders to talk to. We interviewed, we started out with 10 national thought leaders, people who really have an understanding of what's going on with ministry to millennials across the country. And then we, through them, identified 40 additional ministry leaders to speak to. We really wanted to lift up those ministries that are successfully reaching out to millennials, and not just reaching out and bringing them into their worship community, but really growing millennials as leaders. Every institution and system and the ways that we think and behave are going to change with this generation. And as you listen to what I'm sharing with you today, I want you to think about how does this fit with the millennials in my life? How does it, does it resonate? Um, with our sons and our daughters, with the millennials in our congregation. But the other thing I want you to think about is how does this apply to me? Because what we have seen, and I think the biggest surprising finding from our research is that millennials are changing the culture. And they're not just being themselves, they're changing all of us. The purpose of this research really was to lift up those successful models so that we could share what we are learning with Lutherans and other denominations. This was a pan-Christian study. We, we looked at ministry models, not just in the Lutheran denominations, but in other traditions. And then to share practical ideas for ministry leaders. So how can we take what we're learning and say, what can you do next week in your congregation to reach out to millennials? Some key findings from our research. First, it's about accepting who millennials are. Well, who are they? From a 50-something perspective, we forget that now millennials are 83 million strong in the United States. They outnumber all of us. They outnumber the baby boomers. They are making a significant shift in the culture of this country. And just a little snapshot to give you some perspective, we went to the three Lutheran church bodies and said, OK, how many of your pastors are millennials? You'll see that the ELCA, 8%, LCMS, 5%, and Wells, 21%. 21% of pastors serving Wells congregations are millennials. And just in case you're wondering, the definition of a millennial is someone who's between the ages of 18 and 35. There's a little bit of, of argument among researchers on either end of that age spectrum, but we chose the, the broadest definition of this, 18 to 35. So these are individuals who are either in college, newly in, out of college and in their career, um, and many with young families. So to think about who are the millennials and why are they different than the rest of us? It's really about an attitude. And we learned a lot about the role of technology and how that's impacting the lives of millennials. And we came across this term called ambient awareness. Has anyone heard this? OK, we started to call it spidey sense. And what it means is that we know that spidey sense, like Spider-Man, yes. Spidey, yes. Okay. Thank you. Spidey sense, yes. So there is a statistic that says millennials spend 18 hours a day in front of their screens. It doesn't mean that they're sleeping only six hours a day. It means that the odds are that they have multiple screens on at the same time. I have a millennial in my household, and when he was in college, and actually living at home in college, he was. I would walk into his room and I would say, Matt, how come you're not doing your homework? Because he had his phone. He had two computers. And I think he had a tablet at the time, all going at the same time. And he said, relax, mom, I've got this. And he did very well in college. Um, 
but what he was demonstrating is what most millennials are capable of doing is watching multiple screens. And they're paying attention peripherally to their social network. So when something starts to buzz, so you may have Facebook going over here, Instagram going over here, you may be playing a, a multiplayer video game on your computer. When something starts to buzz in their network, that's when they start paying attention to it. But all other times, it's just ambient noise. So think about the challenge of getting their attention. When so many things are vying for their attention, they've become masterful at creating this, this awareness of what's going on around them, not really paying attention, but when something's buzzing, that's when they focus on it. The other thing that we learned about millennials is that they are masters at multidimensional thinking. And there's a term for this, again, another term called the New Copernicans, that researchers are starting to use to describe how millennials think. It's not an either or. It's not black and white. It's not I'm right and you're wrong, or you're right and I'm wrong. It is a way of looking at the world in a multiple dimension and being able to hold that tension so I can be right and you can be right, and you can be right and you can be right all at the same time. Being able to think in three, four, five dimensions at the same time and likely is, is connected to the use of technology, that millennials have grown up with the technology, they've grown up with paying attention to multiple things at the same time, and therefore they are much more adept at thinking in multiple dimensions. And the third aspect of millennials is that they are concentrated in urban areas. I saw a statistic pass by my desk the other day, and I, I, I didn't check it out, so please don't quote me on this, but um, the statistic was that 73% of the residents of Manhattan are millennials. Someone's nodding their head, so I'll count that as verification. <laughs> so millennials are concentrated in urban spaces where they're very close together. And the implication of that is that not only are they having a strong influence on each other, but they're having a strong influence on the rest of us. One of my favorite quotes from one of the um, interviews that we did was that social media is urbanizing everyone. So even if you don't live in Manhattan, you don't live in downtown Chicago, that cultural change of millennials concentrated in urban areas is impacting all of us because of technology, because of social media. Some key insights from our research. First of all, about identity. So what can we learn about millennials? There is an identity crisis among millennials, and it is called the quarter life crisis. And being a researcher, I tested this on my 25-year-old son. I said, have you ever heard of the quarter life crisis? And he said, of course I have. What it means is that the things that we may have experienced in our midlife, age of 50 or so, why don't I earn more money? Why am I not more successful? Why does my neighbor have a better house and a car than I do? Millennials are experiencing this at the age of 25. When they're looking at celebrities, um, they're looking at um, athletes who are very successful, very wealthy, lots of fame, lots of seeming accomplishment, and saying, how come I haven't done that? And if I haven't already done that by the age of 25, what's the rest of my life going to be like? Have I failed? And it's a very real thing. And I, I, again, I asked my son, I said, have you heard of this? He said, yes, I have. He said, for me, it's about athletes. Athletes signing multi-million dollar contracts straight out of college. They're younger than me. What am I going to do with my life? Um, Second, the urban influence, and I touched on this a, a little bit, that no matter your age, one of the things that we're seeing in the research is that people of all ages in urban areas are adopting millennial attitudes. So baby boomers, Gen Xers, who live in urban areas are tending to think and behave and display display those behaviors that millennials are. So there's a tremendous influence of these 83-some million millennials on all of us. 
they have a tremendous mistrust of institutions. One of the research studies we looked at said that of all of the institutions, churches perhaps are the most mistrusted by millennials. Think about the impact of that. However, they want to belong. I am so glad that all of you have used the word tribe today because that's really how millennials think about belonging. They are searching for a place to belong. They don't want to belong to an institution, however. They want to belong to a tribe. They want to feel welcomed. They want to feel welcomed for who they are and they want that sense of, of belonging, uh, almost like a family. Contrary to popular belief, they are philanthropic. They give. They don't likely have as much money as a baby boomer, so they're giving less, and they're giving in different ways. And they aren't giving because they feel obligated. They aren't giving because someone told them they had to. They're giving to the causes that they believe in. They aren't giving out of loyalty. So there's no, again, if they mistrust institutions, they're not giving out of obligation. They have no habit of doing that. There's no loyalty which says, you're going to support this institution because it's something that you're supposed to do. And one of the words that we heard most often in our interviews was the word authentic. And it was most often connected to the word leadership. They are looking for authentic leadership. And of course, we asked, being, not being a millennial, I said, well, what, what is that? What does that mean? They are looking for leaders who are living real lives, imperfect lives. They're looking for that authentic leadership over perfect form. So now you're starting to think, OK, they don't like institutions. They don't want to belong places. What are the implications for the church? I think there are some significant implications. And it was a, probably about halfway through the research. As someone who really loves the church, I thought, wow, this is terrible news. This, I, I, there was a kind of a dark moment when I really lost hope. And then I started to look deeper into the research and think, what are, what are the implications? There is great hope. There is great hope because millennials want to belong and they want to believe. I think we heard earlier that millennials are spiritual without being religious. 78% believe in miracles. 77% believe in God. I think someone else said 90%. Um, I think there's some conflicting data between some of the different studies. 75% believe in life after death. 62% of millennials say they talk to God daily. 59% of millennials who grew up in the church say they plan to leave it and never come back. Or they plan to leave their faith and never come back. They favor independent practice over the institution of the church. When we started looking at the research and hearing about what the ministries that are really successful at engaging millennials, we started to see a pattern develop. And we believe that there are multiple ways that millennials engage in faith and in turn faith communities. And these are signposts. I, I like to think of this perhaps as the field guide to millennials. And I've thought about just laminating this and handing it out to, to anyone who cares. The first type are scoffers. These are about 30% of millennials who say, I'm an atheist, I'm agnostic, I hate the church, I hate God, I'm never, never going to do that, never, no way, no how, forget it. The second is philosophers. These are the ones who say, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. My faith is about me and God, and I may talk to God, I may believe in miracles, but I don't need the church. I'm just going to do this all by myself. Then we have samplers. These are millennials who are 
perhaps curious about faith practices. We heard a lot in our research about um, the interest among millennials in traditional faith practices and ritual worship and really wanting to understand and, and participate in high worship service. Samplers are people who, millennials who may go once in a while, they're trying out a worship community. We also heard a lot about how millennials are really excited and engaged in causes. Uh, we mentioned, we heard about Tom's Shoes, we heard about um, one of the big ones is Charity Water. Millennials get very excited about those causes. Servers are millennials who will engage in a worship community because it's doing something they care about, like a food drive, helping the homeless, clothing drive, something they, they can get, a cause they can get behind and get involved with. Tribers are millennials who recognize a tribe in a worship community that they want to be a part of. And they may not understand the belief system of the church, they may not understand the behaviors of the church, but they're there because they feel welcome, they feel loved, they recognize a group of people that maybe are doing things they'd like to do, and they want to hang out with these people. But they want to be welcome for who they are and don't necessarily even think about the belief system. We also heard among the successful ministries that we talked to about the importance of sharing leadership. One of the things about this generation is they want to be a part of leadership. They want to have a voice in meaningful ways. Uh, one of my favorite quotes was the person who said, if you have a millennial who's a writer, don't put them in charge of the church newsletter. Celebrate their talent, celebrate their art and the skill and the, the the skill that God has gifted with them, and give them something meaningful to do. Give them something that celebrates their art. We heard m many examples of ministries that involve millennials in leadership roles from teenage years on, and meaningful leadership roles. Another way that they engage is to adopt the belief systems of the of the tribes. So they may have joined a tribe not understanding what the tribe believes or what, why they behave the way they do, but over time, as part of that tribe, they begin to adopt the belief systems. And finally, they become disciplers themselves. They are the ones who are discipling others, who are reaching out to their community, who are sharing their, their faith in Christ and, and sharing with others, here's what I believe and here's why. So if those are the ways that we can recognize how millennials are engaging in the church, what does that mean for churches? What does that mean for worship communities? A couple of things that this tells us about millennials' journey. One, it's about relationship. If you remember, the, two thing, the first two things on the signpost were things that millennials do all by themselves. It's independent practice. I'm, I'm talking to God by myself, or you know, don't bother me, I don't believe in God. Those are things that you can do all by yourself. Everything else requires a relationship. It requires a faith community. It requires a millennial coming together with others to engage in the worship community. It's cumulative. In other words, I can't be a discipler unless I'm part of the tribe. But it's not linear. One of the things we heard over and over again was we might have a lot of servers in our worship community, but we don't have a lot of disciplers. Or they may check in to do a service project, but we might not see them again for six weeks or six months. So they may check in, but they not, may not go through all of the steps of that journey. The third thing, that really starts to challenge how we count. One of the things we asked ministry leaders was, how do, you, how do you measure your success? And in traditional worship communities, we measure that by how many people are showing up every Sunday morning, and how much money is in our collection plate, and how big our church is. And some of the things we started to hear was, we, we, we look at engagement. How many people are on that service project? 
How many people are in discipleship relationships within the church? It's really challenging the way that ministries count. And I don't, we heard some great ideas. I think there's still a lot of work to be done about how we measure impact among millennials. So what are millennials looking for in a worship community? They're looking for service as an entry point. They're looking for meaningful worship, not entertainment. We heard some great quotes around this. Um, one in particular, think about it, and we heard about Starbucks earlier. Thank you, Aaron. Um, if millennials can go to Starbucks and somebody knows their name and they feel like they're part of that community and they have all the entertainment they could possibly want at the tips of their, right at their fingertips, 24-7, 18 hours a day, and they can get good coffee. Why do they need church to do that for them? They don't need church for the good coffee. They don't need it for the entertainment. Someone else told me that the worst thing you can do is put your pastor in skinny jeans. <laughs> I know some of you are very happy to hear that right now. Yeah, so, so it's not about entertainment. They, they can get that somewhere else. They're looking for meaningful relationships. They're looking for that genuine welcome. It's about relationships. Millennials don't like to join things. They don't, membership is a meaningless concept. They want a relationship. It's about belonging first. If I feel welcome in this tribe, welcome for who I am and my talents are appreciated, and I'm not forced to write the church newsletter just because I can write. Then I'm going to start conforming to the group's behaviors. And then finally I'm going to believe what they believe because it's going to be so compelling. They're looking for authentic leadership. They're looking for leaders who are not perfect, but not afraid to talk about their imperfections and not afraid to love people. And they're looking for meaningful contribution. I don't like to stuff envelopes. You probably don't either. And millennials surely don't. It's how, can, how can we use their talents and skills in meaningful ways? So best practices, what are those? Well, it's those symbolic faith practices. Millennials really want to know that there's some meaning behind the worship. We heard a lot of um, interviewees tell us, you really have to tell them exactly why we're doing this. Why do we pass the collection plate? Why do we have this prayer here? Assume that they don't know. And then a genuine welcome. I heard a number of ministry leaders say, you know, you don't want to scare them away. Um, one of the things that we heard was that millennials can spot a fake a mile away. So if you're welcoming them because they can give you money and they're just another person on your rolls, they're going to smell that. Meaningful community service. So what's happening outside the walls of this church? How, can, how is this church involved in the community? Relevant contribution. They want to be part of leadership and authentic relationships. One of the, the things that we heard was millennials really want to be part of something bigger than themselves. And one of the things they're looking for a worship, in a worship community is, can I be part of something bigger than myself? So how do we apply this? One of, one of the goals we set for ourselves is we want to have practical applications for church leaders and ministry leaders that come out of this research. And there is on your table a summary of with including some practical applications, and I believe that on the website at sometime very soon, right now, okay, you'll be able to download the full report, and we, we go into some detail about what are some of the practical applications that we've learned from, from the successful ministry leaders. But I would boil it down to this. The things that we learned is that the successful ministries are moving from consuming to making. And one individual described it like this. For baby boomers, church is like Target. I go in, I get what I want, I pay for it, and I go home. And I really like that. 
For millennials, church should be more like home. I'm coming together with a group of people I love, and together we're making something, and we're making our lives better. Churches need to move from the consumer model to the home model. Second, moving from membership to engagement. So instead of counting how many members do we have on our roles, how many people are showing up for the food drive? How many people are showing up for this event that we're doing in the community? How many people are showing up for um, beer and hymns? That was one of the funnest things I, I heard about. Um, having a, a hymn sing in a beer hall. I think Martin Luther would be very happy about that. <laughs> <laughs> Moving from facilities to third spaces. I love that concept of third spaces. We heard a lot from ministries that said, you know, we, it's less about our Sunday morning service in our church than it is about the coffee shop we have down the street. And that's where we're really connecting to people. And that's what the millennials, you know, they, they love coffee shops. It's all about third spaces for millennials. So how can the church be a third space? And there are some really interesting models that we, we came across. And then fourth, it's less about offerings and more about revenue streams. One of the challenges, of course, if, if we don't have regular members who are giving money every week, how do we support a ministry to millennials? You know, millennials don't have as much money to give. Um, and there are a number of different ways that, that ministries are addressing that. Coffee shops are one. Um, churches running restaurants, that's a model that we ran into. Um, Churches supporting other churches, and, and I was delighted to hear that from a couple of different folks today. Uh, churches dedicating their third Sunday to other ministries and giving to other ministries. Um, we heard a lot about how in the future the church is going to look more like the book of Acts, where the churches supported each other and those who had resources could support those who were working with millennials and didn't have as much resource. So again, every institution and every system, the ways that we think and behave are going to change with this generation. And I'm going to conclude, um, one, of the, one of the secondary sources that we came across in doing our research was a blog uh, called Doggy Head Tilt. And um, it's actually a very serious blog by Mike Metzger, and he, he writes a lot about church and millennials. And he quote, recently quoted Wayne Gretzky, who credits his success as a hockey player to skating to where the puck will be instead of where it has been. And he goes on to say that in 15 years, the predominant culture in the United States is going to look very different than it does today. And he challenged us as churches, can we skate to where the puck will be? What will it take for us to respond to the culture, the change that millennials are creating this culture, and to learn from, from this body of research. And this is just the beginning of the learning. There's a lot more to be learned. And I am very grateful to the Siebert Foundation, the Kern Family Foundation. I'm grateful to everyone who participated in the process and shared their ministries with us. And I'm grateful to all of you for the work that you're doing. And I'm so encouraged. So I said, I, I went through this, this, the middle part of this research. Got a little scary for someone who loves the church. And I'm coming out of this saying there is great hope. There is, a, there is a great body of believers who care about the church, including a great number of millennials. And we're seeing great things. So thank you. <laughs>